of us have been amateur potters or modelers of clay. Do you remember those brightly covered, colored containers about the size of a coffee mug with plastic lids when you were a kid? You pulled the top, top off of the Play-Doh and the most wonderful smell would emanate from the can. Then you dumped out the soft, moldable pieces of brightly colored Play-Doh, usually red, green, blue, or yellow. You're able to take that Play-Doh rub it around in your hand and out would come little worms. Then you might have tried your hand at a little human or animal figure, a big piece of clay for the body, a little round piece stuck on top of the head for the head and smaller little ropes for the arms and feet. The beautiful thing about playing with Play-Doh is that you could make different objects and after playing with them for a while, smoosh it all together again and start over with a new creation. But have you watched a master potter who takes soft clay with just the right amount of water to be able to mold it into the shape of a bowl, a flower pot, a plate, or some other beautiful functional form? A master potter can take that piece which he or she has sculpted, cover it with, gl with a glaze, and then fire it in ovens with 1500 degrees of heat or more to make his creation into a beautiful yet functional piece of pottery that can be admired and used for years and years. But once in a while, that master potter makes a piece that starts out well, but doesn't please him or her for some reason. It's a little too lopsided, a handle didn't come out with the right size, or, or whatever. It was a potter's right to take that piece and, like a child, pulverize it or bend it completely out of shape. But the reason a master potter is declared a master is because they tend to make pieces that are perfect, beautiful, and functional all at once. In that case, it is inconceivable that the potter would take his perfectly made piece and smash it to bits. In a sense, this whole illustration is the argument that Old Testament prophet Job will use in his response to Eliphaz and Bildad, two of his three friends. In these two chapters we are considering today, Job chapters 9 and 10, Job goes over some of the same ideas he has expressed earlier, but one of the central arguments he makes to God is found in chapter 10, where Job argues that God, who is a master craftsman, shouldn't be expected to just crush the beautiful object he has made, the people of the earth, only to destroy them and turn them back into the elements from which they came. Because we have a lot of verses to consider today, we will look at only portions in detail the rest I will summarize as we go along. Let's begin with the first few verses of chapter 9. Then Job answered, Yes, I know what you said is true, but how can a person be justified before God? If one wanted to take him to court, he could not answer God once in a thousand times. God is wise and all-powerful, who has opposed him and come out unharmed. He removes mountains without their knowledge, overturning them in his anger. He shakes the earth from its place, so that its pillars tremble. He commands the sun not to shine, and seals off the stars. He alone stretches out the heavens, and treads on the ways of the sea. He makes the stars, the bear, Orion, the Pleiades, and the constellations of the southern sky. He does great and unsearchable things, wonders without number. If he passed by me, I wouldn't see him. If he went by, I wouldn't recognize him. If he snatches something, who can stop him? Who can ask him, what are you doing? God does not hold back his anger. Rahab's assistants cringe in fear beneath him. So now let's take a moment to pray. Father, I pray that you'd open up our minds and hearts to what you want to teach us today through these um, chapters from the book of Job. Help us to know, Lord, that you are a God that is a great and almighty God. You love us, and yet you are a great judge as well and have complete control over our present lives and our futures as well. Help us to learn from what you want to teach us today. For these things I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Job begins at answering Bildad's words and probably Eliphaz's speech as well by noting the absurdity of any person trying to defend themselves in a courtroom against God. 
The human being is powerless before mighty God, who is perfect in every way. Even though Job would, will protest that he was a pretty good guy in God's sight, he wasn't perfect by any means, even though he is highly rated, at least in the beginning of this book of the Bible. Even if that man tried to defend himself in a thousand different cases, he could never win. Then Job goes on in verses 4 through 13 by describing why his case is hopeless. Just listen to the attributes of God's power in these verses. In verse 4a, God is wise and just not super intelligent. God is the essence of all wisdom. In fact, no one can have wisdom that compares to God's wisdom. He is all powerful in the latter part of verse 4. Moving mountains, verse 5. Creating earthquakes, where in verse 6 it says, shaking the earth from its place so that its pillars tremble. In verse 7 he says, he can even command the sun not to shine as well as the stars. In verses 8 and 9, he creates the heaven, including all the different constellations familiar to men. God has the ability, even if he desired to even walk on water, showing his domination over the oceans, as we see in the latter part of verse 8. God does unnamed but obviously powerful acts of all kinds that are so numerous, Job can't even name them all, as we see in verse 10. And in verse 11, Job says that he wouldn't even recognize God because he doesn't even know how to describe God. He just knows that God is out there somewhere and can do whatever he wants. In verse 12, we see that God's power is such that no earthly force can stop him. If he wants something, be it inanimate object or human, God can take it and do with it whatever he wants, including judging its sinful nature. In verse 13, Job warns that if God gets riled up about something, there's no holding back his anger. Rahab's assistants mentioned here are mythical sea monsters and a symbol of chaos similar, similar to Leviathan he had mentioned earlier in chapter 3, verse 8. In the culture of that time, these represented forces of chaos that needed to be subdued by God. In verses 14 through 24 of chapter 9, Job continues with his theme of God as super powerful judge with no limits to his authority. Job asserts that even though he is blameless in his relationship to the Lord of the universe, that this doesn't seem to make any difference. It doesn't matter whether I'm guilty or innocent, God is going to judge me severely. Just look at how he has taken away all that I held dear, my family, my wealth, my health. And these friends of mine are glad to add their own condemnation as well. But I tell you, I'm an innocent man. Let's read now, beginning in verse 25 to the end of chapter 9. My days fly by faster than a runner. They flee without seeing any good. They sweep by like boats made of papyrus, like an eagle swooping down on its prey. If I said, I will forget my complaint, change my expression and smile, I would still live in terror of all my pains. I know you will not acquit me. Since I will be found guilty, why should I struggle in vain? If I wash myself with snow and cleanse my hands with lye, then you dip me in a pit of mud and my own clothes despise me. For he is not a man like me that I can answer him, that we can take each other to court. There is no mediator between us to lay his hand on both of us. Let him take his rod away from me so his terror will no longer frighten me. Then I would speak and not fear. In these verses, Job continues with his complaint that even though he's innocent of any guilt, it doesn't matter because God will find him guilty anyway. Besides, life is brief. The years fly by, just like a man running a hundred yard dash. It's like an eagle that is flying around who spies a rabbit or squirrel and before the animal knows what has happened, scoops him up and takes him back to his nest. Job complains that even if he were to confess some kind of sin in his life, he says, if I wash myself with snow and cleanse my hands with lye, verse 30, it would make no difference. The judge would just pronounce him guilty anyway. In verses 32 through 35, 
Job continues his complaints by confessing, even if God were a man like me, and we were able to talk with one another, he wouldn't accept that. There would be no mediator between us. It would just be my word against God's word, and the fact is, I'm in a situation where God is a judge, jury, attorney, and jailer. I just can't win. In the next chapter, Job continues his complaint by saying, Don't just assume that I'm guilty, God. Take a good look at my life. Don't forget that you made me. Is it a good idea to reject the very thing you've made? Let me read beginning in verse 8 of chapter 10. Your hands shape me and form me. Will you now turn and destroy me? Please remember that you form me like clay. Will you now return me to dust? Did you not pour me out like milk and curdle me like cheese? You clothed me with skin and flesh and wove me together with bones and tendons. You gave me life and faithful love and your care has guarded my life. In these verses, Job argues with God that God shouldn't just take one of his creations and destroy him, turning him back into the elements from which he was made. He speaks in verse 11 in one of only two instances in God's word about the process of creating a human being. You clothed me with skin and flesh and wove me together with bones and tendons. Psalm 139 verse 13 says in a similar fashion, For it was you who created my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. In verse 12 of Job 10, Job changes mood and sounds appreciative of God's love and care. You gave me my life and faithful love, and your care has guarded my life. In verses 13 to 17, Job reverts back to his accusatory style again. God, you had a hidden place against me. Even if I tried to do the right things, you weren't going to give me any credit. No matter what I've done, you've already made up your mind. But I know that is your spirit. You can't, you won't tolerate sin. In the last few verses of chapter 10, Job revisits an attitude that he had demonstrated in his first response to Eliphaz, just let me die and rest in peace in the grave. Continue with verse 18. Why did you bring me out of the womb? I should have died and never been seen. I wish I had never existed, but had been carried from the womb to the grave. Are my days not few? Stop it. Leave me alone so that I can smile a little before I go to a land of darkness and gloom, never to return. It is a land of blackness like the deepest darkness, gloomy and chaotic, where even the light is like the darkness. In his closing thoughts, Job once more wishes that he could go immediately from his mother's womb to his earthly tomb. Here's a man who is in deep despair, and there seems to be nothing that can be done to get him out of his black spirit of depression. Once again, we've covered a lot of territory by considering Job's response to Bildad. Even though Job lived thousands of years ago, he still has much to teach us in our daily lives. Let me list just a few of those principles. First, God is our judge. He will punish us for our sins, so our only hope is to ask forgiveness for those sins so God can restore a right relationship with us. I've never had to stand before a judge who is evaluating if I've broken the law, and I hope I never do. But we can imagine that being in court can be a fearful thing. The judge and jury have the power to take the freedom that you have by being a citizen of this country and deciding that your transgressions need to be punished by a specified time locked up in prison. But imagine how much more fearful it must be standing in front of Almighty God as judge and jury of our total life. Even though we've committed sin against God or against our fellow man, we still have a chance to restore our broken relationship but that can only happen when we confess our sins and ask God to forgive us. That is where we have a better chance for justice than Job did. We can confess our sins and God Almighty can forgive those sins and restore us in right relationship to Him. Two, we may try to justify our attempts at righteousness, 
but we shouldn't try to do it on our own. God is the only one who can truly justify us. Don't you hate it when someone who has done something wrong tries to make excuses for what they did? I didn't see the light had turned red until I was already in the intersection. I just thought I would borrow that money, but I was going to pay it back right after I won the lottery. You get the picture. The only one who can truly justify our actions is God, and that can only happen when we are in right relationship with Him. 3. Remember that God is the one who created you, and He has also created the capacity for a relationship with Him. I think it's, this is the most hopeful part of Job's rather depressing speech. God made each one of us. He knit us together. He gave us our minds, our intelligence, and our abilities. We have to agree with the popular expression, God don't make no junk. Each one of us has a capacity for greatness, and it is because we can know God and be molded or sometimes remolded in the shape that best suits his purposes. I trust that this message has not been all doom and gloom for you, that it also had elements of hope in it as well. So what do you need to do to get right with Almighty God, the God who created you in his image and gave you the capacity for a relationship with him? Do you need to confess your sins against God or even against other people? This may be your opportunity to make things right in God's sight.